plenty yeah, of legs. Yeah, we've got plenty of legs. Yeah. Must be that Bangalore torpedo, isn't it? for these rifles can be anything. In 1914, with a short magazine in, down! Right, lads. Three rounds rapid. On the target. Watch and shoot! Watch and shoot! Sure that 
each one of us. Use our weapons to the fullest degree. I want a bit of guts. I don't want you to mess about with our Jerry. I want you to rip his heart out. Now, lads. Exhaust, did you say? Our heart, Corporal. Hearts. We address our bayonet framed up. When you're given the word on guard, we give a blood curdling shout. What do we get? A blood, blood curdling shout, Sergeant. Good. Like this. Sergeant Dench, on guard. Ah! You fix the target with your BDI. With one up the spout, you advance towards the enemy and you give them what for? Bullet, bayonet, butt. What do we give them? Bullet, bayonet, butt, Sergeant. Here we go then. Watch closely, my boys. Ah! Bang! In the O! Twist! In! Out! But! Double back, is that clear? Yes, yes Sergeant. Sergeant! Is that clear? Yes, yes Sergeant! Sergeant. One at the top. Ah! Advance! Ah! <laughs> ah! Yes, all that stuff. At it, Ed! <laughs> you! One pace forward, on! I've got them. On guard! Time they're doing this today, so you've got to sit now. That's what I wanted to see. <laughs> I think it's right to the noise, Sarge. <laughs> well, everybody, these German soldiers, get down to the centre. Me, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> like the
Then something then. Close one, wasn't it? And the section we're going to a hasty defence of the Viking battles were fought at sea, and these could be used to board an enemy ship. If you had enough money, you could afford one of these. The sword. Typical Viking sword, three feet long, razor sharp along the edge, but not particularly sharp at the tip. This is because it is a hacking and a With the assistance of my brave helper, Talk Elf. <laughs> this is what the Dane Axe looks like in action. Oh, my God. 
Now then, ladies and gentlemen, as, for, as uh, Iron Fist said, if you want to cheer on your uh, favourite contender, now is the chance to do so. <laughs> if it's Uther you want to win, let me hear you shout Uther and Maud down. Oh, that mighty day there. Me ain't going to last long mm. with that. And now the professional <laughs> takes on the peasant. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly seems fair, that tiny knife against that great big axe. <laughs> And it seems it was no contest whatsoever. But now the Iron Fist has stepped forward. <laughs> oh, oh, it fast long. It seems that skill counts more than money. <laughs> One last combat. And it looks like Rothgar's disdaining the use of his axe. And he's going to use the sword instead. Can he take out the spearman? <laughs> Barefoot poor spearman, he can move very quickly, quicker than Hrothgar in his armour. Come on, spearman! Uh -huh. Spearman, get him! Got fast hands down. Yeah. The agility that you've got when you haven't got armour. Yeah. It looks like Hrothgar is uh, tiring, he's breathing heavily. <laughs> Trip on! <laughs> Just one jab with that spear, past the shield, and not even the armour will save him from that razor sharp spear point. Behind you, Hrothgar! Oh, he got him! That's an arrow! Hrothgar is there! <laughs> 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 Oh, is the winner. Oh, yeah. And now, the enemy. You Saxon scum! You
19th century, the time of the Napoleonic Wars. Britain had been at war with France on and off since the year 1789. So at the stage where we at, we are at, Britain has been at war for over 20 years. Much higher French forces, and that is what you're about to see deploy in front of you. Over on our right hand side you see a thin red line, a line of British redcoats famous British red coat. A number of soldiers there marching under the twin flags, the King's colour and the regimental colour. And troops came over and served with the British forces. Over on the left hand side wearing the blue coats we see the men of Napoleon's Grand Armée. And the first volley of musketry and artillery crashes out. A combined force of Frenchmen there. Artillery of the artillery légère, the light artillery. Frenchmen of the 30th Regiment, the 30M. And the 45th Regiment, the 45M. As well as dismounted cavalrymen there of the Chasseurs de Cheval. Facing them, of course, the famous British Redcoats, as I said. A variety of units depicted here. Men of the 9th East Norfolks, the 1st and 2nd Foot Guards, and the 2nd Queen's Regiment. Very loud, don't they? And you can see the French artillery are working very fast indeed, reloading their guns with skill and precision. Sending shots out to fly over the heads of the British troops. And now the French commander has sent out skirmishers. Men not operating in a line, operating independently, working in pairs, front man firing, <laughs> man behind reloading, and then swapping over. Mom. Operating in uh, loose skirmish formations like this, they're less likely to suffer from casualties. The British, on the other hand, are choosing to line up shoulder to shoulder. They're more likely to take hits and casualties. With the inaccurate brown bess rifle, or brown bess musket as I should call it, if they fire all of those muskets at once, they're more likely to hit something. It is a notoriously inaccurate weapon. Now the French commander is obviously very confident, he's pushed his men far out into the field. He's not taking cover behind the uh, earthworks we see behind them. This situation could change later. Another blistering volley goes out. And men of the Royal Artillery have the weight of their firepower to the combat. Yes. Now, it might seem strange that the British Redcoats are dressed so gaudily and so brightly or wear something as bright as possible in order to intimidate your enemy. And of course, wearing this British Redcoat lets them know that you are British. Now, the men of the 45th are advancing, taking casualties. We're pushing the French skirmishers back now. The guns of the Royal Artillery are pushing forward as well. Moving to murderously close range, they'll probably be switching from round shot, solid iron cannonballs, to the more murderous and effective grape shot. Firing dozens of small musket balls in one blast from the cannon house. And you can see, even with only a few muskets in this field, the smoke begins to hang thick and heavy. You can see where we get the phrase, the fog of war from. 
Imagine, if you will, a damp and humid day. The smoke would linger on the battlefield, make it very hard to see what was going on. And that's why it's so important to have musicians and colour bearers on the battlefield. From a long distance you can see those flags, you know where the rallying point is for your regiment, should you get cut off in the heat of battle. And of course the drummers and the buglers are also important, relaying orders across the battlefield that soldiers can hear, much like a modern radio man would. And you can see obviously this British advance is proving too much for the French, they're pulling back behind the security of their mighty earth walled steel. It's bound to send them fleeing back to their lines. But unfortunately, accurate French musket fire stopped that charge in its tracks. And those French skirmishes have bought time for the uh, French artillery to move up behind the security of that earthwork. And now the British artillery attempt to batter down the tops of that wall, the tops of the earthwork wall, behind which the French guns are hiding. We see there the British soldier close to, closest to us. He's a sergeant. His rank donated by that long pike, or spontoon as it was known, that long pole arm. Sergeants and colour guards would carry those to protect the colours, the flags of the regiment, against enemy horsemen. There are no horsemen present on the battlefield today, so the sergeant obviously feels secure enough to leave the colour guard, to leave the colour party. Now these brown best muskets are reasonably primitive weapons, accurate only to a range of about 50 yards, although they could kill at a longer range if they actually hit their target. Because they're so inaccurate, as I said before, that is why these weapons are fired in such, such great numbers all at once. If you fire 20, 40 or even 100 muskets together, you're bound to hit something. Or so the thinking went. Also, keeping your soldiers shoulder to shoulder meant you had more control over them. Wellington's Redcoats were famously once described as the scum of the earth. So obviously, the sergeants want to keep tight control over these men. Keep and it looks like the British are pushing forward skirmish troops of their own on the right flank, down at the far end of the arena. Soldiers operating in pairs finally pushed the last of the Frenchmen up onto the earthwork defences. And now it's time for a push here on the left flank, sending these serried ranks of British redcoats up the hill. The musket. And it looks as though the French artillery are biding their time, saving their ammunition, waiting for an attempted British assault up that steep bank. This could be very foolhardy. <laughs> Sending infantry into the teeth of French artillery behind a defended position. And obviously the grape shot has been too much for them. And they send them scurrying back to the regimental surgeon. At his butcher's work there with his bloody apron, tending to the wounded, giving what rudimentary battlefield care he can. Just jeering at the British. Yeah. What will the British commander do next? He's already sent one attack that's failed up the hill. It looks like on the far flank he's trying to infiltrate some skirmishes into the wood line. And it seems that the sergeant has regained control of his shaken men and is sending them forward into the battle line once more. The French now conserving ammunition, just sniping at the British, attempting to hit sergeants, officers, the men who command. And of course, those soldiers are also trying to uh, hit the. British artillerymen, if they can take out the gun crews, silence the guns, then without any heavy artillery the British have no hope of taking this position. The case is flogged quite literally to death as a punishment for cowardice in the face of the enemy. 
like Dines, there's some big ones. You just write that block turn and French gun to the lad. Dines. He does the attack into the guns. Well, they're going to attack, drop, aren't they? Leaving their wounded comrades to be operated on by the, uh, the regimental the surgeon. The butcher, as he would have been known as. <laughs> There's a French cannon. As we said earlier on, surgery was rudimentary, amputations were common. <laughs> Survival was certainly not guaranteed after a visit to the regimental surgeon. <laughs> now the Redco line has been pushed forward ever closer. It looks as though at the far end of the arena, to the far bank of the French defending. Supported by the artillery there. The artillery forcing the French to keep their heads down. And it looks like the British officers are preparing another assault. <laughs> if the British artillery, the Royal Artillery, can put some heavy fire down on that bank, keep the Frenchmen's heads down, there may be a bayonet charge up that hill. will work this time. <laughs> Cool. And this time it looks like the British artillery having some effect. So rounds exploding on the French bank there. Bowling over a few soldiers. Oh. It's sharp attack. And now that the French guns are fired whilst they're reloading, now would be the time to send them attack up that hill. <laughs> There comes the attack. It looks as though the British are choosing to trade musket volleys with the French. <laughs> Officers there berating their men for their lack of fire. <laughs> and more and more British troops are beginning to cross the ditch at the far end. Oh, they took a couple out. French snipers taking their toll of British officers. God, they're flying somewhere, right? It looks like the, the British line is recoiling from the weight of French fire. Oh, surgeon's getting his sword. British out. riflemen. The British surgeon now working under the very teeth of the French guns. We <laughs> <laughs> sorted him out. He got the magic sponge out. We can hear the French drum beyond the gun line. Beating out orders to the uh, reinforcements hidden behind that ditch. And now an artillery duel develops between the French and the British guns. A very deadly competition to see which of the crews can serve their guns fastest. And at the moment it looks like the French are winning that competition. Mm. And again the French guns bark out. <laughs> the British guns reply in turn. Yeah, he must have done. They're going to attack up. The British officers there passing on orders, sending runners to each of the units. It looks as though they are preparing one final assault, one last push in an attempt to dislodge the French from their secure position. Make ready! It goes the final assault, isn't it? Fire! Recover! Dress on the left, dress on the other side! Fewer and fewer of the British brown best muskets seem to be firing. Here comes the French, they're attacking. When due to casualties, the guns, the gun barrels are becoming foul with burnt powder. The more you fire these guns, the more powder residue builds up. <laughs> it does indeed seem as there are bayonet charges going in now. British red coat fighting a French blue coat. <laughs> With a British cold steel 
will triumph over French Elan. It looks as though the British are indeed pushing the French further back up that hill. French skirmish is right dead around the field. <laughs> but the British haven't been able to push all the way up the hill just yet. A second attack goes in now. Men of the foot guards this time. Can the guardsmen take the artillery position? <laughs> it looks as though one of the ensigns, one of the men carrying the flag, has been hit. He stumbles back out of the battle line, and an ordinary soldier snatches up the colours. Grabbing them, at least they uh, fall on the ground. A great dishonor should the flag actually hit the ground. And now the Redcoats go up the hill again. I really think they can hit them. Will the gunners be able to hold them off? The French gunners on the hill? Or will they choose the sensible option of surrendering? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now it looks over on the far side of the hill, British soldiers have managed to cross that ditch. <laughs> charging up the hill. This is not my spot in the line. One last salvo from the guns crashing out to give them support there. Yeah. I don't think the French can hold out for much longer. So give those red coats a cheer as they go up the hill, ladies and gentlemen. And now just a small mopping up operation going on. The British finally taking possession of the French guns. The flag moving up the hill to be planted firmly on top of that hill. Reasonably firmly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're just about to prepare our arena for uh, the last of our chronological di chronological displays for uh, the morning and the early afternoon. Stabso Verbal of the uh, German Army, Stabso Verbal being a staff sergeant of the World War II Living History Association, and he's going to take you through the commentary for this next part of the display. And we are talking modern warfare, really, in, in the terms of 1944. So communications are vital. Uh, uh, radio, of course, was perhaps the most important. That could be monitored. And so another way was to lay simple LAN telephone cable. Is that that loud man, Joe? Yeah. Is that mine? Uh, the jeep was adapted for all sorts of purposes. You can see here the, the, uh, the, the uh, cable laying drum at the front here, and behind is an ordinary jeep. Uh, with some guys giving them some backup. Nobody really knows quite where they are. Would you believe the four stooges? <laughs> There's a novel use for the handle of an entrenching tool. is absolutely right for World War II, called a Daisy May. Only the Americans could call a piece of military equipment a Daisy May. <laughs> in fact, I'm reliably informed that Daisy does, but that's another story altogether. <laughs> uh, 
Yes, somebody's having a nice war, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Here comes. <laughs> now the, the Americans are in a crossfire. You'll see to your left front the MD-42. And two grenadiers now coming from the other tree line. <laughs> now these aren't really combat troops. They are armed for self-defense, but they're not really combat troops. And what they're up against, of course, is grenadiers of the 916 Regiment. If anybody's seen Saving Private Ryan, these are the boys that uh, chopped down all Tom Hanks' friends on the beach. <laughs> now, of course, there uh, are uh, two things you do when you've got a, when you've got all this lovely contraband. There's a jeep with all this American stuff in it. Now, in theory, of course, they should be looking for maps and documents. And wouldn't the high command like to? That's a bit further forward. Rifle to the shoulder and ready for action. Hmm. Equipment more closely. The best thing to do is come over to our positions and have a look close up, and uh, talk to everybody, and uh, just have a look at all, all the stuff that everybody wore. Yeah. One other thing I will mention, of course, you come to finish. This is the picture of the Devonshire and the Hampshire Regiment. The man nearest to you is armed with a famous blunt gun, backed up by two riflemen. Now, uh, one grenadier didn't make it back to the tree line. The others appear to have pulled back. <laughs> and now you'll note the fire and middle blend tactic. Fire. And now the man's got a very nice position for his gun, which is mounted. Just as well because his upper twos has been taken out. Now you can see the deal between the machine guns, the MG42, and the German tree line and the famous Bren gun. It, it's two to one, but the Germans seem to be pulling back. And I can see now some German movement in the tree line as they're beginning to pull back. The situation is, of course, a single day. There goes that brand gun. Oh, the MG42, which will cover their withdrawal. Germans on the uh, mound also now begin to pull back. Really, they've achieved all they can have. Hello 
So, uh, in fact, here they go. They're pulling back. They've given the covering far while their men uh, pull back. And now their men are clear. They can pull back too. Back to the next. So here we are. Here's, here's, this is going to come back at four o'clock. We'll pick it up around about here and see what happens next. So until then, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. And by the way, you ain't heard nothing yet. Thank you indeed there to the men of the World War II Living History Association. O'clock. Joe Augusta into the arena. Of exhalation here, or section. As it was known as, as it is known here, a grindstone to grind their corn for bread. And it was upon units like this that you would build up into a century of approximately 80 men, and then up into the cohort, and then the legion itself. Now, before we go any further, running up for three years is bad enough. 25 years, the best part of your life, dedicated to the military service of Rome. Now, the armour they wear is called a Loica Segmentata, made up of segments of plate. The reason the soldiers wear this rather than the Loica Hamata, the chainmail that's worn by the auxiliaries, was because in the, uh, in, in the early part of the century, the first century AD, Three legions were wiped out at the Battle of the Teutoburger Wald, not only to strengthen the front of the shield, but also it could be punched forward with, to punch a Celt in the face. The edge could be used to slice somebody under the neck or in the back of the knee. So not only does it form a good a defensive weapon, a good, def a good defense, it also is an offensive weapon as well. Now then, you saw them marching with them as they came in. We next have the peeler carried by the legionaries, the spear. An odd-looking weapon, it's only got a short wooden shaft. The remainder at the end is a, is a two-foot iron shank with a little barbed tip at the end. The idea behind this was to throw at your enemy. It would sail through the air. The metal shank would stick into a Celt's shield, and it would stay in there. The um, spear shaft, the metal shank, would bend. Horse tactic. If they're attacked by enemy horsemen, they need to form an impenetrable barrier so the horse can't charge through their ranks. With the shields like this, Enemy archers can't fire arrows into them. A hedge of bristling spears stick out, which no sensible horse would charge against. Imagine, if you will, a hundred men all adopting this tactic. That forms a completely solid wall against which no Celtic horseman could ever charge against. <laughs> we're not actually going to throw the peeler at you, but imagine if you were a Celtic horse. The shields come up, hiding most of the Roman legionary. Then when they got within throwing range, the spears would come over at you. And the rear rank goes forward. That might be an original shield, of course. That's maybe why it's so brittle. And then the ranks, the ranks move forward, stabbing. Another rank moves forward, stabbing. I'm not sure I'd stand against that if I was you. The point of the Canaan. And again, the gladiuses come out. Again, the gladiuses tapping on the scutums, the shields. Not another tactic, employed as a psychological weapon. To scare the foe. In this case, the foe is me. I'm certainly scared. I don't know if you are, ladies and gentlemen, just behind me. Let's hope they respect the sanctity of the English heritage safety barrier. Excellent. A round of applause there, ladies and gentlemen. And no amount of stones, slingshots, or arrows can harm them. The only thing that might cause them some discomfort will be boiling water or boiling oil poured over them. But then there's plenty more soldiers behind this lot, if you were mounting a full-scale assault on a castle like Old Serum. The French, they've put most of their armaments development into this enormous fortification. We're talking like a kind of a, a defended hill that goes for many, many miles. 
and the hill has got trains running through the middle of it and it's got tunnels and it's got concrete bunkers that can rise up out of the ground with huge shelling cannons inside it and, and guns that can point all the way into Germany. So it's got huge ditches and tank traps and barbed wire that is like a forest. the young gentleman will no longer fancy her. This young lad, though, is poor. Ah! Oh. But he's got very good teeth. What you're going to do is sell her one of your teeth. Oh. Yes! <laughs> it was an operation called the Tooth Transplant. It was pioneered by a famous French surgeon called Ambrose Paré, who lived from 1510 to 1590. It was still being done as late as 1922, because I've got a book that tells you how to do it. So what I will do is I will, first of all, pull out your bad teeth. They were just doing that fashion. There's a medieval dancing going on down there, Lucy would like. With the knights. I think the battle things, this Napoleonic thing is the best one. To do. This is just to preserve the ears a bit up here. Here we are, mm -hmm. up on top of the hill. Yeah, but it's all right to see it from different angles. Yeah, and around it? the back you've got the Spitfires they and the Bills and Bows. They just that 1940s show, haven't they? That yeah. fashion show. Right, the dance column of British Redcoats. The Redcoats seem a surprise. Well, themselves. Well, they are the French soldiers here. We'll see what the French have to say about this. Answer to that question. Thank you. 
Hold up there. She got them surrounded. Headed by skirmishers. Dismounted cavalrymen from the chasseurs of Savelle. Men were sent to the ground. Out of the blood firing the blood rock. 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 Of course, that cannon for us now, they'll get past it. French have got them surrounded. Headed by skirmishers. Dismounted cavalrymen from the Chasseurs of Savelle. Men were sent to the ground. Out of the blood firing the blood rock. 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 Now the British find themselves caught. Fighting on two sides. Of course, that cannon for us now, they'll get past it. French have gone in on the attack, onto the baggage train. Yeah. Oh, 
So we saw them same one. Got one of them in action. And if he's that one, that was it. Parker. Parker. 
all we ought to go. Now, as the artillery comes in, this makes the German position far less I'm sorry. That's Brian. Well, they're bus brought down at Rock Stewart. So. There he is, back behind him. Must be his missus, that one. Down down the 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 and ultimately victorious Romans, the men of the 8th oh, Legion of Augusta. Marching beneath their next to them. It's nice, that long one. Yeah, I like it. In between that, he's getting his. Yeah, he might come over here. Certainly the Frenchmen. I think the British have been so unnerved by their defeat. 
they've decided not to take part in the parade and leave out instead the victors of the Napoleonic skirmish. And behind them, you saw them in action just a few minutes ago, the men of the World War II Living History Association. The British, the Germans, and of course the Americans. And we'll slot everyone into place. Get them to face you. And then call an end to today's magnificent proceedings. I certainly hope you've enjoyed it. We'll just get everyone into place. The Celts, the Romans, and the Vikings. And the gentlemen and ladies of the 15th century. Then Master Robert R. Ringwood with the red and white pole indicating his trade or even his profession. I'm sure he wouldn't call himself a tradesman. And the Napoleonic soldiers slotting in behind each other. Let's hope we'll have enough space to get everyone in line. And the Napoleonic soldiers are now in place. What we need now are the Second World War soldiers. It looks like we're running out of space ever so slightly. That saves us right from having too many magnificent performers for you today. Jockeying for position there between the French and the British. And we'll get everyone in place. Thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Magnificent performers, I'm sure you'll agree. And don't forget to tell your friends and family. There's a farmer Charles's duck farm. There's a gazelle about to take off. World War II encampment. Dave. Spitfires are still playing. I've got a girl from Kalamazoo. Warming up now.